Woman, women. Does this pronunciation difference confuse you? Woman is singular and the vowel sounds are o, a, wo, man, woman. Women is plural and the vowel sounds are i and i, we, min, women, woman, women. Now, whether you are a woman or have women in your life, today's English lesson of over 150 female-focused words and phrases will be useful to everyone. Building vocabulary is important for fluency and so I highly recommend that you make notes while watching or you can download the PDF for free by joining my mailing list. Simply pause the video, click on the link and enter your details. The best part is I will then send you all future lesson notes too. Right, let's begin the lesson. Do you wear makeup? I do. Makeup makes me feel more confident. Some people refer to makeup as war paint that a woman puts on before heading out into the world to face her battles. But whether you wear makeup or not, let's learn some basic makeup vocabulary. Makeup products may be referred to as cosmetics or beauty products. Cosmetics. This refers to substances that you put on your body or face to improve its quality or appearance. Our weekly shop is quite expensive, mainly because of all the cosmetics my teenage girls put into the trolley. The first thing we do is moisturise or hydrate our skin using moisturiser, also known as face or body cream. You can get eye cream, foot cream, hand cream and many other specialised creams for different purposes. Some people might use a makeup base or primer to prepare the skin for the next layer of makeup. It may also be lightly tinted. Tinted means slightly coloured. We often talk about tinted glasses but can also have a tinted moisturiser. These tinted creams give your skin a bit of colour and make you look like you have a suntan. Now, all our faces are different and uniquely beautiful with our individual imperfections. I think my biggest insecurity about ageing skin is getting lots of wrinkles. I don't mind getting spots or having big pores because I can hide those, but wrinkles are much harder to disguise. I guess I just have to learn to embrace them. Wrinkle. A wrinkle is a line or fold in the skin. As we get older, we get more and more wrinkles. And some wrinkles can be quite deep. A pore, pore, is a tiny opening in the skin that allows oils and sweat to reach the surface. We all have lots of pores on our face and all over our skin. Some pores are bigger and more noticeable than others. A flaw, flaw, which has the same vowel sound as the previous word, pore, flaw. A flaw is a fault or an imperfection. I have many flaws, scars, wrinkles, blemishes, but they are mine and they each tell a story about my life. Frankly, I think flawless is boring. Another word for a visible flaw is blemish. Blemish. This is a spot or a mark. Drinking lots of water and avoiding sugar helps to reduce the appearance of blemishes. Acne. Acne is a common skin condition that results in lots of spots or pimples. 
a spot or a pimple is a small, hard, temporarily inflamed spot on the skin. <sighs> As a teenager, I had terrible acne. I was even on medication for it at one point. However, since I hit 26, it's really not been an issue for me. I have the occasional breakout, but usually only a few spots on my back and face. Concealer. Concealer is a thick makeup that can hide blemishes. Conceal means to hide something. Ah, I have a spot coming up right on the end of my nose. I can't see it yet, but I can feel it. It's going to be a big one. My photo shoot is tomorrow. I better go to the shop and buy some concealer. Skin tone. Skin tone refers to the colour of the skin. This top really suits my skin tone. Dark rings or bags under the eyes refers to those dark half circles that appear under the eyes when we are very tired or unwell. Oh, I need to get some more sleep. Look at the bags under my eyes. Foundation, foundation. Foundation is a cream or powder that covers the skin. It provides an even skin tone and helps to hide flaws and blemishes. Now moving on to the cheeks. We can highlight these by adding a pink powder called blusher, blusher. You may hear this referred to as simply blush or rouge. Some ladies like to highlight other areas of the face with a bronzer. This is a darker powder, like a bronze powder, that you may use to emphasise your collarbones, your jawline, nose or forehead. Now, let's move to the windows of the soul, the eyes. Eyeshadow is a coloured powder that we apply to the eye lid and sometimes around the eye too. Eyeliner is either a liquid or a pencil and is usually applied in a line along the edge of the upper eyelid. Mascara finishes the look by emphasising the eyelashes. You will see adjectives like lengthening, waterproof and volumising used here and promises to lift, curl, lengthen or define your lashes. An eyelash curler is a tool that curls your lashes. Do you use an eyelash curler? Personally, I like to use a light coloured eyeshadow. Then I define my eyes with a liquid eyeliner on my top lid and a little bit of mascara. As a teenager, I used to use dark brown eyeshadow and I'd apply a pencil eyeliner to the inside of my bottom eyelid. Has your makeup style changed over time? Let me know in the comments. Let's move up to the eyebrows. An eyebrow pencil allows you to define and darken your eyebrows. Eyebrow gel is also becoming popular as a way of holding your eyebrows in place. We don't want them falling all over the face. <laughs> now to the cake hole, the mouth. More specifically, the lips. You may start by outlining the lips with a lip liner. We then cover the lips with a lipstick. Other popular lip cosmetic options are lip gloss, this is a shiny, sticky gloss that doesn't have the same colour definition as lipstick but can lift the lips throughout the day and it's easy to apply on the go. Lip balm is a lip moisturiser. Some lip balms are tinted. At the end of the day, we remove our makeup. You may use soap and water, makeup removing wipes or a cleanser and toner. A cleanser is a product that removes dirt, oil, makeup and dead skin cells from the skin. A toner is used after the cleanser. This cleans the skin and 
contracts the pores, makes the pore opening smaller. So that's the face done. What about the body? Well, you don't really apply much to the body other than moisturizer. You may decide to apply a fake tan, also known as tanning lotion. Just be careful if you're doing this yourself for the first time. Your look can be finished off with a nice set of nails and a lovely hairdo. Nail clippers cut our nails and a nail file is a tool we use to smooth and shape our nails. We can apply nail varnish, aka nail polish, to colour our nails. There's a variety of amazing colours and patterns you can choose from. To remove the nail varnish, you will need a nail varnish remover. It's a very original name. Some ladies go for false nails that you stick on. If you treat yourself to having your nails trimmed, shaped and painted professionally, this is called a manicure. Manicure. A treatment on your feet and toenails is called a pedicure. Pedicure. Both of these treatments are viewed as a luxury or indulgent rather than a necessity. My fake tan was applied last week and I'm really pleased with the result. Now I am just about to have a mini manicure and pedicure in preparation for the ceremony. Then I will have my hair done and get married. Oh, <laughs> wish me luck. Every month women from around the age of 13, 14, up until their late 40s or early 50s will experience a period, a bleed from their vagina. Now, once you hit around late 40 or 50, a woman will enter what's called the menopause and therefore they will not have this monthly bleed anymore. A bleed, which we often refer to as a period, comes at the end of your menstrual cycle. Now, although we often use the word period, we also have many other terms. So for example, you might hear in medical circles, the term menstruation, menstruation. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have lots and lots of slang terms. There are so many, I can't possibly mention them all, but here are just a few. A visit from Aunt Flo. This is a play on words, a pun, because the blood flows. It's a flow of menstrual blood. It's a menstrual flow. And Flo is also a name, a female name, um, short for Florence, perhaps. Got the decorators in, or got the painters in. <laughs> They're painting, making a mess. That time of the month, which is something I often hear actually, is a way to say it without really saying the word period, which a lot of people find embarrassing. So they'll say, oh, it is that time of the month. And riding the cotton pony. Now the cotton pony, I assume, refers to the sanitary product that you use in order to soak up the flow, the blood. And that brings me on to sanitary products. In the UK, when you're on your period, there are around three types of products that you may use when you have your period. A sanitary towel, a tampon, or a menstrual cup. Firstly, a sanitary towel, also known as a sanitary pad. Now, you can get these in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Firstly, some of them come with wings, which are these extra little bits that fold around your knickers to hold the sanitary towel in place. So this is a sanitary towel with wings. You can buy sanitary towels without wings and you will buy them depending on their level of absorbency. So if you have a lot of blood, you'll need a very absorbent sanitary towel. For the time when you don't need the full support of a sanitary towel, then you can purchase a panty liner. A panty liner. A much smaller, thinner version, just in case. 
Then we have a tampon. A tampon is an absorbent piece of material which you insert into your vagina and it will absorb the flow. And as it absorbs, it expands and it's always on a string. Now, in the UK, the brand Tampax is so famous that a lot of people use the name Tampax to mean a tampon. Very similar to Hoover, we will use the word Hoover to describe most vacuum cleaners, when in fact the word Hoover is a brand name. It's the same with tampons. I might say to you, do you have a Tampax? And what I'm asking for is a tampon. I don't care whether it's a Tampax brand or not, I just need a tampon. Anyway, when you're buying tampons, you will notice they also come in different levels of absorbency. So you get really big ones and then quite small ones depending on the level of flow. But you can also buy them with an applicator or without an applicator. And it really is personal preference as to which one you prefer. This one is without an applicator, but the applicator is a long plastic tube which helps you to insert the tampon correctly. So when you're buying tampons, look out for with applicator or without to make sure you get the right ones. More recently, the menstrual cup has become popular. Now the menstrual cup, often in the UK known as a moon cup, which again, I think is a brand name, but a moon cup or a menstrual cup is basically a silicone cup which sits inside the vagina and collects the menstrual flow and you empty it, clean it and reuse it. And I think it's become popular in recent years because of the environmental impact as well as the fact that it saves you a lot of money on sanitary products. Now sometimes we have to talk about our periods, whether it's with our friends or with a doctor. So how do we describe the type of period that we're having? When talking about our period, there's normally five categories your period will fall into. Either you're having a heavy period. This means there is a lot of blood. It's very heavy. On the other hand, you could be having a light period, which of course refers to a period where there isn't much blood loss. So you might say to your doctor, I'm a bit concerned, I normally have very heavy periods, but recently I've had light periods. You might have irregular periods. Now because your period comes at the end of a menstrual cycle, you can usually accurately predict when your period will start and how long it will last. However, if your period starts at different times every cycle and it's hard to predict, then you probably have irregular periods. If your period doesn't arrive at all, then this is called a missed period, or you would say, I've missed a period. And the period that stresses out most of us, the late period. When you expect your period, it's teasing you, but it doesn't arrive exactly when it's supposed to, leaves you worrying for a few days. And then finally, there it is. Now let's talk about symptoms. Of course, you're bleeding. It's your period. So blood and bleeding is one of the symptoms. Sometimes the bleed isn't always liquid. You might have what's called blood clots, little lumps of blood. Worth noting how big they are because you may want to tell your doctor if you get very big blood clots. Now besides the bleeding, all the symptoms you experience before and around your period can be referred to as PMS. PMS is premenstrual syndrome. So if you're experiencing period symptoms, you can just say to people, look, I've got PMS and they will understand what's happening. So what kind of symptoms are we talking about? Firstly, bloating. Bloating is where your stomach, your abdomen feels swollen and uncomfortable. Very, very full and tight and ugh. You may also get abdominal cramps. We often just shorten it to cramps. I've got period cramps, you might say. And this is the pain in the lower abdomen. Ugh, and it really, really does hurt. Some people experience mood swings, depression, irritability. So it really has an effect on how they feel. 
You may have sore or tender breasts. Ouch. Some people experience headaches and a few unlucky women also get migraines. You may experience bad skin. We sometimes just say, I'm getting spotty or I have spots. It's that time of the month. Guess what? I'm up the duff. I've got a bun in the oven. I'm expecting. We're having a baby. Yep, these are all ways that you might say, I'm pregnant. During my time of pregnancy, I realized that there are lots and lots of words that are very specific to pregnant people. So let's get started. So the first thing you do if you think that you are up the duff, if you think you're expecting, if you think that you are with child, hmm, or that you have a bun in the oven, then you will take a pregnancy test. Once you've taken the test and it comes back as positive, hurrah, you're pregnant. Hopefully you're very happy about that. The next thing you'll do is go to the doctors to find out exactly when your baby is due to arrive. Now the word due is used a lot when talking about a baby's expected arrival. So the day when you are expected to give birth to that child is your due date. So throughout your pregnancy, the medical professionals will ask, when is your due date or when are you due? And now that you're pregnant, you might refer to yourself as a mum to be. I'm a mum to be. Or if you are the partner of someone who's pregnant, you might refer to yourself as a dad to be. Or as a couple, you could be parents to be. Now your pregnancy will last for approximately nine months. This is called the term. So if your baby gets all the way to nine months, 40 weeks approximately, then you are at full term and your baby will hopefully be born full term. If your baby is born earlier than 37 weeks of pregnancy, then your baby is preterm. And then we refer to that baby as premature. These nine months are separated into three sections. We have one to three months is the first trimester, the first trimester, the time when you are the most unwell, probably. Then we have the time when your bump, your belly really expands. And this is the second trimester, month four to month six, the second trimester. Then you have the very uncomfortable final trimester, which is referred to as the third trimester, which is month seven up to month nine, the third trimester. Throughout your pregnancy, you are going to suffer with a number of pregnancy symptoms. For example, fatigue, heartburn, cramps, sleepless nights, those types of things. But there are a couple of symptoms that are very specific to pregnancy. They are morning sickness, and this is the nausea that you experience specifically in pregnancy and stretch marks. Now, stretch marks are the scars and marks that you get on your skin when your skin is expanding with pregnancy. Stretch marks can also be associated with rapid growth or weight gain. And as you're gaining weight, you are going to need to buy some special clothes. Now, these clothes are referred to as maternity wear maternity wear and you can describe individual items like maternity jeans and maternity bras, maternity leggings, maternity dress. Let's now look at some very common medical terms that you will hear throughout your pregnancy. First off, we have placenta. Placenta. The placenta is a very important interface between baby and mother. It's where they attach to each other. It's how the mother passes things like oxygen and food and all the stuff the baby needs from her through to the baby. And the placenta is attached to the baby via the umbilical cord. Umbilical, umbilical cord. Now the baby is technically referred to as a fetus. A fetus, which has a different spelling between British and American. This is the British spelling, a bit weird, and the very sensible American spelling. The baby lives very comfortably inside the woman's womb. Womb. No B on the end, it's a silent letter. The womb. Or the uterus. The uterus. 
and inside the womb they are surrounded by amniotic fluid. Amniotic fluid, which keeps them safe, protected from infections and protected from getting bumps and bashes when mum bangs her tummy into things because she's clumsy. Now the opening to the womb, which allows the baby to come out eventually, is called the cervix. The cervix. And on a very sad note, if the pregnancy doesn't continue, if something goes wrong and the baby doesn't survive the pregnancy, it's called a miscarriage. A miscarriage. Now throughout the pregnancy, you will check on your little one to make sure everything is progressing well via a scan. You will have a scan. You can have a 2D scan or a 4D scan, which is what we had. And it was amazing to see our little baby's face. A couple of other events that you might mark throughout your pregnancy are a baby shower, which is a party to celebrate a woman moving into motherhood. And you may also go on a baby moon, which is a holiday that you have with your partner to enjoy the time that you have left before the baby comes and turns your world upside down. <laughs> throughout your pregnancy, you'll be looked after by your doctor and by a midwife. A midwife is a medical professional who specializes in looking after pregnant women and going through labor and childbirth with them as well. Some women also decide to have a doula. A doula is like a birthing coach, someone who helps you through labor and through childbirth. Now, at the end of your pregnancy, you will be rewarded with a beautiful baby. And we're going to dive straight in and learn some vocabulary around childbirth. So first, we talk about having a baby or giving birth. So you have a baby, but you give birth to a baby. You may also hear the verb deliver used when talking about having a baby. You deliver a baby and often the room in the hospital where the baby is delivered is called the delivery room. It actually reminds me of the story of babies being delivered by a stork. Do you have something similar in your country to explain where babies come from? You will be giving birth to your baby when you are full term hopefully. Now if your pregnancy lasts longer than 40 weeks perhaps you go to 41 weeks, 42 weeks, maybe even longer than that, you are overdue. You're overdue. Your baby is overdue. Commonly, when talking about giving birth, we will talk about how we gave birth. There are two main options. You either have a vaginal birth, now this is the medical term, vaginal birth. That means the child comes out through your vagina in the way that nature intended. However, us Brits get embarrassed when saying words like vagina or vaginal. <gasps> so instead we prefer to say natural birth. I had a natural birth. Another way to give birth is via a cesarean section, otherwise known as a C-section much easier and quicker to say. A C-section is where a cut or an incision is made through the abdominal wall and the baby is released that way and brought into the world through your tummy. You may hear some people saying that they had a water birth. This is a vaginal birth. The baby was delivered naturally but in water, in a special pool, in the labour ward or perhaps at home. In order to have a natural birth, you must go through a process called labor. Labor is laborious. Labor, the word, means hard work. So your body does a lot of hard work in order to push that baby out of your body. When talking about this process, we talk about going into labor and being in labor. So if a woman comes into the hospital and she is about to give birth, you would say this woman is in labor. Hopefully labor will start naturally or spontaneously, but in a lot of cases, labor will need to be induced. So an induction will be necessary. If your labor is induced, then medical intervention is required to start the labor off. There are a number of ways in which they can do this. First of all, your midwife or your doctor will try a membrane sweep or a cervical sweep. This is where they rub their fingers along the cervix 
to separate the membrane or something like that, but they basically give it a little rub to hopefully get things going. If that doesn't work, then you will be properly induced. First, they will try something called a pessary. A pessary. This is a tablet, or sometimes they use a gel, that is inserted into the vagina and it melts and releases hormones, I believe, to stimulate the cervix to thin and start the process of labour. Another way to induce labour is to use a hormone drip. So they drip fluids directly into your veins and this is done via a cannula, which is a needle and a little opening that they put into your vein in your hand usually so that they can easily put fluids in a cannula. Once you are in labour, if you're in the hospital, you are likely to have, at some point, a vaginal exam. Now, the vaginal exam is firstly to check, has your mucus plug come out? A mucus plug is a plug of mucus that plugs the cervix. So it's the little plug that keeps everything in the uterus. And once that comes away, hopefully then, your waters will break. Now the waters breaking, we're referring to the amniotic fluid in the fluid sac, the amniotic sac that surrounds the baby. Once that ruptures, all the fluid comes away and the baby is ready to be born. We talk about this coming away of fluid as the waters breaking. So where did your waters break? Now my waters broke at home, luckily, but it happened pre-term and I wasn't in labour, my membrane ruptured, my waters broke and all the amniotic fluid came away and then I knew I had to go to the hospital because at some point soon I should hopefully go into labour and once those waters are broken that baby is no longer protected so that baby has to come out. I had to have a vaginal exam and in this vaginal exam they are also looking to see whether or not your cervix has begun to dilate. Dilate, dilation, is the word that we use to talk about the opening of the cervix and we talk about it in centimetres. So normally when you're about to give birth your cervix will be around 10 centimetres dilated so it'll be quite wide open, probably not that big. <laughs> maybe more like that. And that will then allow the baby to come through. But earlier on in labour, in my case for example, when I was in labour, I only got to around four centimetres dilation. And that was tough. The pains that you experience during labour are referred to as contractions. Now the word contraction has many different meanings, but in labour it solely refers to the tightening of the muscles that naturally push the baby out. So let's talk about the pain relief that you use during labour. Firstly, we have hypnobirthing. Hypnobirthing is where you use the power of positive thought. You use techniques like breathing and visualisation in order to have a drug-free childbirth. Commonly, many women will use gas and air, which you just suck up and it instantly relieves the pain. There are, of course, then pain relief medicines that you can have injected. There are a number of those. Or you can opt to have an epidural. An epidural is an injection that goes into your back and it makes you paralysed from the waist down so you don't feel any of the pain. Similar to that, you have something called a spinal block. The difference between an epidural and a spinal block is simply how long it lasts. I had a spinal block when I then had to go for an emergency c-section. So they gave me a spinal block so I couldn't feel the incision in my abdomen. If you're having a natural birth then there are a few things that will happen. The baby will start crowning when he comes towards the end. So when you can see the baby's head when he's just about to pop out that is the baby crowning. Now hopefully his head won't be so big that he tears you. When we talk about a tear down below we, we talk about it in first, second, third degrees of tear nastiness. So if it's a very bad tear, it might be a third degree tear. If it's not a bad tear, it will be a first degree or a second degree. I'm not a doctor, I'm not quite sure exactly how it works, but 
they are tears. Now to avoid you tearing down there, you might have to have what's called an episiotomy, where the doctors or the midwife will cut a little, a little bit of the skin down below in order to release a bit of pressure to allow the baby to come out without tearing you in a bad way. And that's called an episiotomy. Now the area they usually cut is between the vagina and the anus. And this is called the perineum, I believe. The perineum, oh, lots of new words. Episiotomy, perineum. If the baby is struggling to come out, then the doctors may need to use forceps which are like two spoons that they put in to help pull the baby out. Now, whether you have a natural birth or a C-section, there is a risk of hemorrhaging, especially once you give birth to the placenta. Do you remember what the placenta is? We talked about it in the pregnancy vocabulary. It is the interface between the baby and the mother attached to the baby via the umbilical cord. So that is the placenta. Once you give birth to that, some people have a risk of hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging. And at some point after the baby has been delivered, someone has to cut the cord. Usually it's daddy who cuts the cord, but it might be some other member of your family or a friend, or maybe just one of the medical professionals. When I was in the hospital, I shared a room with a lady suffering from preeclampsia. Preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is a condition involving high blood pressure, which is a danger to your pregnancy. So when you are pregnant, your doctors will keep an eye on you to check for signs of preeclampsia. Once your beautiful baby is here in the world, their first bowel movement, their first poop, will be called meconium poo. It's a very different texture to their poo afterwards. The first few days their poo is like tar, it's black, it's sticky, and we call it meconium. Ugh. It's very sticky. Finally, the types of medical professionals you are likely to come into contact with throughout pregnancy and childbirth are a midwife who specializes only in supporting pregnancy and childbirth. Then above that you have an obstetrician, obstetrician, which is a doctor that specializes in pregnancy and childbirth. Then we have a pediatrician, a pediatrician. A pediatrician specializes in the treatment of children. A gynecologist, a gynecologist. A gynecologist is a doctor that specializes in women's reproductive health. So everything down there, a gynecologist will look after. And finally, if you require an epidural, so if you're having a C-section or an epidural for natural childbirth, you will see an anesthetist, anesthetist. That one is a difficult one to say. Anesthetist. Time to learn some newborn baby vocabulary and childbirth vocabulary. So you have a newborn baby. Now the term newborn can be used on its own. So newborn can be a noun rather than an adjective. You have a newborn baby or you simply have a newborn. I have a newborn. If I'm having something delivered, I will leave a note for the delivery driver saying, I have a newborn, please be patient, as it might take me longer to answer the door. If you do have a newborn, you will often be asked whether you are breastfeeding or bottle feeding. So do you feed your baby breast milk or formula, which is a special milk made up from cow's milk and lots of additional good things for your baby. Some people do a combination of the two a little breast milk and a little formula. I am breastfeeding, but I also express my milk using a breast pump. So I pump the milk out manually with an electric breast pump and I store it so that I can feed my baby with a bottle later on. So I'm bottle feeding, but with breast milk. Now when using a bottle, you really have to think about which kind of teat or nipple you will have on the bottle. They come in all sorts of different levels of flow. So a newborn baby will need a teat that has a slow flow, so they don't eat too much or choke on the milk. And if you are using bottles, then you will have to sterilize them using a sterilizer, perhaps. If you pass me an empty bottle for me to put in my expressed breast milk, I may ask you, has this bottle been sterilized? 
Another item that you will want to sterilize is a dummy. A dummy. Now, a dummy is referred to often as a pacifier or in more recent times, a binky in American English. But in British English, we still commonly refer to it as a dummy. Weaning is when you start taking them away from drinking breast milk and formula and putting them onto real food, often referred to as solids. Is your baby eating solids yet? Have you introduced solids? The decision to stop breastfeeding, to wean your child and introduce solids may come as a result of the child teething. Teething. When a child experiences teething, it means that they are growing their teeth out. Their teeth are coming through. Some women are not comfortable with their child breastfeeding when they have teeth coming through. But something I can say from experience is breastfeeding is very helpful as a comforter to your child, especially when they have to have things like vaccinations. Vaccinations. Vaccines are given to babies from the very first day and they have many of them as they grow and these vaccinations can be quite distressing for the child. So popping them onto the breast for a quick comforting feed makes them feel better when they have those horrid, horrid needles stuck into their legs. Let's talk about mum. After having a newborn, mum enters a period called postpartum. The postpartum period, the time after having a new baby. This time can be very emotional. Many women experience it ups and downs and some women even feel depressed. Depression in a postpartum period is called postnatal depression or sometimes shortened to PND. Have you ever suffered with postnatal depression? It is very common. If breastfeeding, the mum will also have experienced engorged breasts. Engorged. This means when your breasts are so full of milk that they become hard and painful and swollen. They are engorged and easily relieved by expressing some of the milk or breastfeeding. If you have chosen to breastfeed, you'll be wearing a special type of bra. This is called a nursing bra. It will obviously be bigger than your ordinary bras because your breasts will be a lot bigger. And they also have special clips just here so that you can unclip and get easy access to the nipple without removing the whole bra. And within the bra, you'll have to wear something called a breast pad. These are special absorbent pads that go inside the bra, especially to catch the leaks of milk so that you don't make a mess of your clothing. If, like me, you had a caesarean, a c-section, then you will have a caesarean scar. So people might ask you, how is your scar? Is it healing well? Is it large? Is it small? Now enough about mom, let's come back to baby and the items that a baby wears. Now often babies wear a vest, a cute vest with no arms or legs and often they have poppers at the bottom so you can easily access their nappies. It's nappy in British English, diaper in American English. Also, we have a baby grow or all in one. It looks like this, with long arms and long legs. Now, because baby's nails are very sharp and they scratch themselves, we often put them in scratch mitts, tiny little mittens to cover their hands to stop them from making a mess of their faces. And some parents like to put little booties on their babies, tiny little boots. They are very cute, not very practical, but still sweet to look at. From about nine weeks old, babies begin to dribble a lot. And in order to catch the dribble and to stop it from going on their clothes and wetting their vests, they often wear a bib, a bib just a piece of material that goes around the neck. And for the moments when they throw up or vomit or are sick, you will need a muslin, which is just a piece of cloth that's nice and soft, absorbent, ready for those little sicky moments or snotty moments or even dribble or when you spill food. Very handy. We have literally about 50 muslins around our house to catch all of that stuff. When wrapping your baby up to keep them nice and warm, particularly for bed, we are often advised to use a cellular blanket, 
a cellular blanket and these are blankets with little holes in them so that they are breathable so your baby doesn't get too hot. This is what they use in the hospitals and this is what they recommend you use for your baby. A lot of babies these days have special baby sleeping bags, sometimes referred to as grow bags. And many babies have a thermometer in their bedroom so you know the temperature and you know how to dress them for bed. Now a baby's bedroom is often referred to as a nursery, a nursery. And a baby's bed is called a cot or a crib, a cot or a crib. And a very small basket type bed that you put a newborn in is called a Moses basket, a Moses basket. For the times when you need to be mobile, you will put a child into a pram that's sometimes referred to as a buggy or once they're sitting upright, a pushchair. If you're taking them out in the car, they'll need to go into a car seat. But if they're just hanging out in the front room, you might want to put them down in a baby bouncer, 